let's uh, discuss on how uh, one would manage this patient. Yeah, so, you know, the second, the treatment options for second line or third line setting for extensive state small cell lung cancer are actually quite numerous. So if we were to open the guidelines, um, many different drugs are listed. There's taxanes, there's uh, lorbinectidin, of course, there's topotecan. Uh, there's also, you know, PD-1 and PDL one inhibitors are listed, maybe not in combination, but definitely alone. And then um, re-initiation of uh, platinum-based chemotherapy is a very viable option. And um, I just wanted to ask you, Vivek, you know, did you think about reinitiating carboplatin and toposide in a patient like this before coming in with lorbinectidin? And do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. I think this is a great, you know, academic question as well, because when fellows rotate with us, you know, we, we got to uh, teach them. And, and it's easy for small cell lung compared to many other cancers, because um, we have a, a, a few, uh, you know, uh, few in our therapeutic armamentarium, right? So it's simple. So less than six months, if they have a relapse within uh, six months, or if they have a relapse after six months, within six months, uh, it, you know, again, at major academic centers, the, we would con definitely consider a clinical trial. If the patient has stable disease, if the patient is clini clinically has a good performance status. In the community setting, if the patient doesn't have access to a clinical trial, specifically for second line small cell lung cancer, then active agents here in this setting are, of course, topotecan, and the new agent, new kid on the block, lorbinectidin. Um, and I, beyond six months, right, that's when we have a lot more options that you all mentioned. Uh, the NCCN guideline lists uh, checkpoint therapy, right? With Caspian and IM power reading out, uh, it'll be hard for me to re-challenge a patient who's progressed on frontline uh, platinum-based plus immunotherapy with immunotherapy again. So in this patient, possibility is we could re-challenge the patient with immunotherapy. Right? We could try immunotherapy. But right now, since uh, PD-1 is a standard of care in the frontline setting, uh, I would say lorbinectidin is an option, topotecan is an option. Again, the conventional agents, uh, you know, uh, uh, like paclitaxel is an option. Re-challenge of platinum. Uh, Again, if it is greater than six months, uh, there are, there, there's so much data about re-challenge of platinum. So why did I choose uh, lorbinectidin for, for this patient? You know, we, we see that lorbinectidin is an active agent in small uh, uh, brown blue cell tumor cancer. And uh, again, I wanted to try something different for this patient because I did not want to try the same thing for the patient and have the uh, platinum-based therapy as a back pocket option in case the patient progresses on lorbinectidin. Yeah, we often find that, you know, the toxicity profile may define the choice between platinum reinitiation or resensitizing somebody with a platinum doublet versus using lorbinectidin. I often find that if a patient had a lot of myelosuppression in the first line setting, and if it's been a short interval, I'm more likely to reach out for a single agent therapy than actually go back in and go, go to platinum doublet. Tofik, what do you usually do? Do you have a preference? Let's say, let's talk about chemosensitive disease. Let's not talk about chemoresistant disease. We're trying to make it a little bit harder and challenging to treat patients. So Vivek, can you walk us through the data that led to approval for lorbinectidin? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for that question. So lorbinectidin is a, is a new agent. It's a, uh, it's a marine a biologic derived from under the sea. And uh, yeah, SpongeBob, yeah, yeah, from under the sea, and uh, it's it's an interesting agent. It has a you know interesting mechanism of action, and preclinically it showed activity in multiple uh, small round blue cell tumors like Ewing sarcoma and other uh, small uh, round blue cell tumors. So it is a, a you know selective inhibitor of onc oncogenic transcription, and you know this study recruited uh, this was a part of a basket study that recruited multiple small round blue cell tumors, and the small uh, cell lung cancer cohort uh, consisted of 105 patients. Uh, between uh, two, October 2015 and Jan 2019, 105 patients were enrolled with, uh, you know, post-platinum uh, treated with, uh, and were enrolled and treated with lorbinectidin at a flat dose of uh, 3.2 milligrams per meter squared. The median follow-up here was uh, 17.1 month, 
and the overall response rate by investigator assessment in this case was seen in 37 patients, which comes to 35.2% uh, in terms of objective response rate. Again, what they saw in this study, uh, as with other studies with lorbinectin in, was the same uh, toxicities of hematological toxicities, anemia, uh, leukopenia, neutropenia, uh, thrombocytopenia, and you know, serious adverse events occurred in 10% uh, you know, of patients with neutropenia and febrile neutropenia, and no treatment-related deaths were reported. And you know, based on this study, uh, lorbinectin as was shown uh, as an active second-line agent in small cell lung cancer. Again, uh, as we all know, this small cell lung uh, cancer has been devoid of treatments for two to three decades, especially in the second-line setting. So it's always good to have a new kid on the block, to have something in our back pocket to give our patients. I think this was encouraging, and based on this data, uh, the drug lorbinectidin uh, received US FDA accelerated approval. Uh, and you know this, this is another option for our patients. Going, do you uh, routinely come in with growth factor support to try and maintain that dose, or would you, you know, let cycle one pass and then come in with dose adjustments? Tofik, maybe you can comment. Yeah, I think my own practice when I use lobinexidine, given how, <clears throat> given the fact that we know that a substantial proportion of patients will need growth factor support, rather than waste time on insurance denying the approval for growth factor use after you started the treatment, I tend to just plan to use it. Uh, as I initiate treatment uh, for the patient. And the, when you do that, you actually see that you are able to maintain the dose of 3.2 milligrams per meter square without having to dose reduce. And I think that is really important in this disease. Of course, we don't have a very clean uh, study to look at you know, the reduced dose versus the full dose of 3.2, but from the phase one, we also know from there that you know that dose intensity going to 3.2 was associated with a higher uh, rate of response. The other place where I always want to use growth factor is in those patients with chemorefractory disease uh, because that's actually where you want to maintain that intensity. So if they're going to benefit from it, I want to make sure I go with the full dose and give the patient all the support they need to be able to stay on. How do you define response in a patient on lorbinectidin? And are you happy with stable disease? How long do you keep treating? So um, my approach, and this is in line with how the study was designed, is I look more at clinical benefit as opposed to clinical response. Because as we know, when we do scans, we don't sit down. The radiologist doesn't do all the resist measurement that we go through on clinical trial to say you have 30% reduction or 20% growth to say whether or not the tumor is growing. So the first thing is how the patient is feeling. Mm -hmm. So if the patient is getting better in terms of their symptoms, they do not have a lot of side effects, they're not ending up in the hospital, and they're tolerating the treatment they're on schedule uh, as planned, I know that that is helping them. Then the second is the objective measurement as best we can, which is with the cross-sectional imaging. So if based on the scan, the radiologist looks at it, and I look at the report and confirm that the, this is under control. I go by disease control as opposed to disease response in this setting. So it's the combination of the objective measurement with the scan as well as the patient's objective reporting that allow me to decide whether or not the patient is benefiting. I do not prescribe a defined number of cycles for a patient. When I start patient, I always discuss, we're going to continue this for as long as it's helping and you're not having bad side effects. Right. So it's, I continue until we have to change to something else or the patient decides that they need a break. I think that's so 